All right. Hello, I'm uh, Martin Holst Svende, and I work uh, with security um, at Ethereum, at the foundation, uh, which is something that I started at in September, um, the day before DevCon 2 <laughs> kicked off. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Shanghai attacks, and I am going to talk about the technical aspects of it. And we start with uh, what are the Shanghai attacks. So here's an image of uh, what we call the Shanghai attacks. It's um, roughly a month long. Uh, as you can see, there are lots of uh, activity going on there in different colors. Um, so it's a, a month-long barrage of attacks uh, involving thousands of contracts, uh, roughly maybe 50 core attack contracts, uh, which can be classified into maybe 20 or so different attack types, uh, carried out with varying intensity and varying success. And uh, I'm going to dive right into the, the technical aspects of the attack. So the first attack is the Shanghai with love attack, which occurred on September 18, when I'd been the security guy for uh, not, not, uh, not 24 hours. So it was a call in the morning, and there's an attack on the network. Uh, and the main attack contract was the D6A6 up there. Uh, but it also had some other uh, contracts to, to help out with the attack. It had these helper contracts, a hundred of them. Uh, they looked like uh, the unintelligible data up there. What the attack did, uh, the main contract did, was take the XOR key of, from Shanghai with love uh, and then produced addresses of uh, legitimate, it's hard to see with that font, uh, addresses of legitimate contracts on the chain. Uh, the contract then proceeded to do X code size on all of these. And after it had done so on all of those uh, legit contracts, it made a call into 47B3, which was a delegate call tower. So the delegate call, uh, a very simple thing. Uh, it just, it was a call to the contract and the contract did a delegate call to itself until it went out of gas and the whole thing was reverted. Uh, so yeah, you probably know about the delegate call. Uh, it just borrows some code and executes in its own context. In this sense, it could probably have been uh, used a, a call tower instead. Um, but this was an attack against a, a specific client implementation, Go Ethereum, because uh, when Go Ethereum made an external call, uh, it copied the, the current state because a call can be reverted. So if you have a set of data and uh, you might want to make changes, but you might want to revert those changes, one way of doing it is just to copy that data and make changes to this copy and either you keep the copy or you throw away the copy and keep the old one. And that's what Get had implemented. Uh, so it had all these uh, thousands of contracts in the memory. It made a copy of these uh, for the delegate call and it did it 1,024 times. Uh, so it had about 52 million instances of contract code in memory. Um, and all the Get nodes basically keeled over uh, and uh, so there was a large disturbance in the force at that point. Uh, about an hour before the attack, er, or, or sorry, before the conference started, uh, a fix was rolled out called From Shanghai With Love. And the fix uh, was basically a band-aid where only dirty objects were copied during this uh, um, copying. Uh, a bit later, we were hit with the first variant. So instead of, uh, it, it was the exact same attack, but instead of X code size, it used the call mechanism. Uh, 
the call is a bit more expensive than its code size, so they couldn't do it as many times. Uh, the call operation, uh, that's a very core to Ethereum. Uh, if you're familiar with Solidity, you know that there are several ways to invoke methods on something. You can invoke a method, or you can just send ether. Uh, but underneath the hood, both of these mechanisms use the call opcode. So it's both the opcode responsible both for invocating invocation of methods and for sending ether. And the thing is that with the fix earlier about dirt, dirty methods and dirty objects, uh, call flagged objects as dirty since it's normally used to transmit ether. Um, so in this iteration of the attacks, uh, the whole call would uh, cause a lot of copying again into this new cache. Uh, it wouldn't explode like the previous attack, but it just became really, really slow and really uh, memory intensive. Um, that was fixed pretty speedily with uh, Into the Woods, um, which contains various fixes to state handling in general, uh, but also contained a shortcut so that whenever there was a transfer with zero value, it was effectively skipped and there was mostly a no op and no dirty flag was set. <coughs> and the day after, we saw an attack which started uh, hitting the IO because these two previous attacks uh, had been mostly focused on expanding the memory of the nodes. Uh, and this was also extremely simple in constructions. What you may or may not see uh, in the little black box there is just uh, a long uh, a long printout of pop x code size gas, which means that he asks for what is the code size of this amount that I have in gas, a uh, pseudo random value, and just ignores the return results. So it just causes the EVM to perform lookups on non-existent addresses and hit the disk a lot. And uh, on a 1.45 million gas, he was able to do, well, th this type of contract could do about 60,000 lookups uh, against the disk. And a few days later, he, uh, sorry. There was a next attack uh, where the attacker was experimenting with uh, some opcodes he hadn't tested before. An S-load quadratic attack. And the main contract for that uh, contained two distinct sections. One section was uh, responsible for setting up for the actual uh, payload execution. Uh, calling that setup method uh, just wrote to the storage slots. So the attacker called it uh, 450 times, filling up the storage slots uh, slowly, up to 6,700 storage slots. And when that was finished, the execution to do an, an S load on all these storage slots and then the same old delegate call tower. And this was something which was both surprising and not surprising. It was an attack which was kind of foreseen, but the effects were not really uh, what we expected. Uh, yeah, so a side note about sources of data. This was using the S load, that's in the storage area of a contract. So there are other, um, you have the memory also, which is a temporary storage area during a transaction or actually during a part of a transaction, a specific context. Um, there's the call data and the code, and the code is what was used in, in many of the attacks via Xcode copy or Xcode size. So the effect of this one with S load was very similar to the original attack. Not quite as bad, but it was bad because the storage of an account was treated 
as a whole. And uh, there was no discrimination between dirty storage slots or, uh, or not. So these um, 6,000 storage slots, they were copied again in that, uh, with that amplification of 1,024 and uh, caused a lot of problems. So that's when the release 1415 come at me bro came, which tracked dirty state entry and entries for each account object. And um, yeah, then, then the attacker came at us. And <laughs> I think there was, yeah, the day, the day after that came the, the self-destruct revert mm -hmm. contract. And that was also um, a pretty complex construct using one main contract, same old delegate call towers, 30 helpers and 2,500 suicides or kamikaze contracts. The suicide or the self-destruct as it's called nowadays, uh, it's a bit of a special snowflake uh, in, the, in the family of opcodes. So it means that uh, we, we, this, this account, this contract account should now be terminated. All the state storage uh, associated and balance should be removed. Uh, the balance transferred to a beneficiary. And it's, uh, it was originally very cheap. And this, uh, the reasoning behind it being that, well, the, the it was paid instead up front during creation. So we made the suicide cheaper to incentivize cleanup. Um, there are some quirks about it, such as it can be invoked multiple times during um, a transaction. Uh, during an envelope of transaction, it can be invoked in many sub-transactions. Um, and of course, as any other, other transaction, in case the envelope transaction is um, terminated with an auto gas, the effects are reverted. So what happened here was that the attacker had built up this huge cache of kamikaze contracts, performed suicide 2,500 times, then went into a delegate called Tower, which naturally self, uh, sorry, um, went out of gas. So all of this was wasted and um, caused quite some problems. And as we were monitoring this, we could also see that uh, the creation of these kamikaze contracts stopped and then it started again, but now with a pattern that each suicide contract was endowed with one way, uh, smallest unit. Because, I don't know if you remembered what one time earlier here, I said that the fix had been to basically no op a zero transfer of value. And by endowing each contract with one way. Um, he could also hit against that particular optimization rollout about a week before. So that was really an instance of the attacker trying out an idea, then, aha, uh -huh, I know how to make it even better, and just switching tracks and going with that. Uh, and these attacks took quite some time to set up. It was possible to monitor, okay, he's created 4,000 now, he's up to 6, yeah, he's probably gonna hit it in about two hours, gonna see him execute these attacks. And many of the earlier patches were basically band-aids to this, to this scheme of copying things, running away with the copy and doing changes, and then deciding which to keep. So, at this point, journaling was implemented. And journaling there's a, is another approach to how you can mutate data. You have your data here, and when you wanna make changes to it, you make the change in the original data, but you also keep a note on the side where you s specify exactly what you did. And you keep doing that uh, on the same original data, and you have a journal, and at the end, you just decide, okay, I keep this data or not. And if not, then you just go through the journal from bottom up 
and uh, reverse every change. So that makes um, the whole reversion thing a linear problem instead of a potentially exponential memory problem. <coughs> right after that, um, the attacker kill off all these uh, suicide accounts which he had created earlier. And we saw something which was kind of new because the earlier attacks had mostly targeted individual inefficiencies in certain clients, mainly Go Ethereum. But at this point, the attacker found that uh, it was possible to, to really hack against the core protocol, the, the specification of Ethereum. Uh, there's a main contract, 6AOA, and on the fly, when invoked, it creates one kamikaze contract. It then proceeds to call this kamikaze contract n times. And every time that kamikaze contract is invoked, it will perform a self-destruct into a new address, new, a previously not existing address. Um, Earlier I said that there was a quirk that you could actually do this kind of invocation multiple times. The reason being that the suicide is actually not performed until after the, the envelope transaction. It's one of the tasks performed uh, upon the conclusion of transaction. So the code is still there uh, while the call is ongoing and you, and you can suicide several times. And even if you have already suicided once, you can still send your non-existent ether to a beneficiary. And if that beneficiary doesn't already exist in the state, it would be created. And what does it mean that something exists in the state? Well, in, in the technical, pure technical sense, it means that it is an entry in this whole tree, the cryptographic tree, and that its existence um, reflects upon the root hash. So, yeah. Uh, so during this attack, which hit the October 11, it was kind of obvious that this couldn't be fixed by any individual uh, caching mechanism or optimization to the client, but that this was hitting against core specification and a hard fork was needed to come to terms with this. Um, it was announced on October 13. It took about, yeah, it was rolled out on October 18, a mere five days afterwards. And during this time, the attacker kept uh, bloating the state, uh, going up to 19 million accounts. And before the attacks, there were about 700,000 uh, legit accounts. So there was quite a lot of, of damage that was that was done in a short time. Uh, here you can see when EIP-150 happened. There's a big gap in the attacks there. Um, actually, the attacks continued a few blocks, but they were unsuccessful by that time. Uh, there was a repricing of several offerings, one of them um, repricing of creating an account during suicide which was previously free. Uh, so there's a gap there. And after the gap, the attacker did some new attacks against using balance, the balance opcode, and uh, EXP. And the EXP attack directly aimed at, uh, uh, at being CPU resource intensive. Uh, those attacks were kind of successful against uh, nodes on laptops or with limited <coughs> CPUs, less successful on uh, servers. Uh, but the balance attack was then later included for the next hard fork. Uh, oh, sorry, the EXP uh, was fixed in the next hard fork for repricing. Um, yeah. 
So this was the, um, the month-long attack that we call the Shanghai attacks. I think I have a couple of minutes left for questions. So, yes. So the question was how much ether was spent in the attacks. And yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, I meant to say that uh, there's an it's an estimated around 800 ether that was spent on the attacks. And uh, basically one month of full-time work during the attacks and hard to say how much time before the attacks. Uh, but I would, I would say that it was quite someone quite dedicated and persistent um, doing it. Yes? Do you have an idea why the attacks were performed? If I have an idea why the attacks were performed, uh, I don't really want to speculate about that uh, here and now. Uh, I'd rather focus on the technical details. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think, we, I mean, we need to, to think about all these issues when we do the specifications uh, and not, I mean, really not code for the average case but for the worst case and do as good job as we can to, to spec it properly, make it testable properly, measure it properly. Um, and there are ideas about how to do governing uh, around Ethereum to enable uh, how, how to do repricing, for example, or how to decide about when to do hard forks. Do you have a proposed way of doing that from the perspective of security? Right now we have for features, so for new features we do have EIP, but um, you know, if not, maybe that's something for another customer. Yeah. That might be. I mean, we need to have an open dialogue about security and, and do security modeling and, and coordinate across the teams, which I think we're doing a pretty good um, job of right now and even during the attacks. Uh, it impressed me. Uh, I think we have time for maybe, or do we? Yeah, one more question. I, I know it's hard, but have there been any, any tries to break down uh, where it has been? Um, we have very limited options. Uh, we can see the chain movements. Uh, I can't say anything more than that, really. Yeah. Uh, uh, really quick. Did you, did you did ever see anything, any attacks like this in the test act before this attack? Not that I know of, no. Not that I know of, no. <laughs> Thank you.